Okay, so today uh, we are starting by looking at the beginning of World War I, and in particular we're going to be looking at sort of what are the longer causes of it uh, over the course of the late 19th century and then into the early 20th century. We're going to be examining two other parts to that, right, not just sort of what are these longer causes. We're going to be looking at a treaty signed between the British and the Russians, and then we're also going to be looking at how does technology impact um, how does technology impact those immediate sort of parts of the war? So let us start by looking at the long causes. So we often talk about Europe or more importantly, the Balkan Peninsula, uh, which I hope you remember is sort of this old part of the Ottoman Empire uh, in Southeastern Europe that has been a problem really since the Ottoman Empire has started to fall in the late 1900s, uh, sorry, late 1800s. But Europe is, itself is also going through a lot of different struggles at this time. Europe is um, becoming unsettled itself. One of the big problems that Europe is experiencing is the fact that you have a couple of emergent powers in the late 1800s that lead to major problems, right? So Germany and Italy are two countries that enter the stage, and we've talked about them in the past. They are two countries that enter into, um, into the scene, let's say, in the late uh, 1800s, right? Germany unifies as a country in 1871, and you have two leaders, particularly Otto von Bismarck and Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, Otto von Bismarck is the Chancellor of Germany and Kaiser Wil Wilhelm is the King and the Emperor. And in Italy you also have uh, major nationalist leaders who want to try and sort of have the prosperity of Italy and Germany outweigh the other places. So what you have happening is these two places, these two countries, start fighting with the other parts of Europe to try and expand their power. And we know already that Kaiser Wilhelm is part of the problem for the development of the Berlin Conference, right? And, and Ottoman Bismarck calls the Berlin Conference in 1884. You also have sort of growing hostilities among people within Europe, right? So you have the Franco-Prussian War in 1870-71, that is really the, the thing that helps put Germany together uh, at this point, right? Germany had sort of throughout the 19th century been um, slowly coming together as a country. And then all of a sudden in the late 1870s or in 1860, 1870s, you have the sort of final blows that bring them together. Once Germany has been unified piece to this is that as Germany and Italy are growing into their powers, there's an alliances that are formed too, right? So what happens is Germany and Italy are in need of developing uh, sort of their own alliances. So what they do is Germany, Italy, and Austria-Hungary come together and unite as well. And then you also have, in order to sort of fight against this, you have the British, the, the well, I should say first the French and the Russians come together. And then you also have Britain sort of coming on with that as well. So that by the end of the 1800s, early 1900s, you have this structure where you have in the center part of Europe, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy unified. And then you have Britain, France, and Russia unified. This leads to um, a sense of nationalism. So you have, or I should say that nationalism is something going on, but there's also sort of increased nationalism here. So the Slavs, who are people here in the, Bal uh, the Balkans, right, um, Slavic people, Yugoslavia and all that, are looking sort of for greater amount of autonomy and, and, and connection among different groups of people. Uh, so they are looking to sort of Russia and others for support. There's also massive amounts of competition between the different people of Europe for colonies. So you have 
uh, the beginning of obviously competition uh, in other places. There's also a massive amount of militarism. Uh, if you remember, right, uh, back to our Industrial Revolution unit, we are in the second phase of the Industrial Revolution. We are, uh, in, you know, by 1900, we have had the first phase and we are into the second phase. So there's a lot of new technology being built and, and technology being put into warfare, right? So people are, are building tanks and airplanes right because airplanes developed in the early 1900s we have uh the buildup of navies the machine gun all of these new technologies that people are now willing to put towards towards warfare and you grow as you do that you're also growing your army so all of these things are happening at the same time finally on june 28 1914 a guy named archduke franz ferdinand is assassinated in Bosnia Herzegovina by Serbian nationalists in a group called the Black Hand. The war then starts by August 1914 and fighting goes on throughout Europe and other parts of the world. Italy switches sides. Uh, so Italy fights. Uh, Italy had initially been a un in united with the Germans in the Austrian Hungarian Austrian Austro Hungarians, excuse me, but they switch sides to the um, to the British French uh, and Russian sides. Much of the fighting, at least in the early phases, happens in what's called the Western Front, which is in um, largely in France. And then you also have another fight going on on the Eastern Front, which is between Germany and Russia. You also, in Italy, you have fighting going on between Austria and Italy. So you have a lot of different um, battles going on here. This is what we call a war of attrition. A war of attrition is a war whereby there's no really set means of d defeating other groups. Uh, you're basically just trying to wear them down until you can sort of knock them out. So there's trenches, and we'll talk about trenches in a few minutes. Uh, but there's also really basically just trying to reduce their um, their ability to continue to fight. This is we call this a world war. This is really the first world war in terms of not just its name, but also just really including all of the world, right? Um, so you have obviously British, French, Russians, Germans, Austrians, Italians, but you also have people from India, China. Um, you know, India, China, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, fighting for the British. You have you have the Ottoman Empire involved uh, on the side of the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians. America winds up getting involved in in the war late, true, but they get involved at least uh, by 1917. World War One sees a a huge new surge of technology. Now, warfare has changed substantially with World War I. Why? Because we have, as I say, new technology. You have German um, chemists developing uh, chemical warfare, uh, phosgene, chlorine, mustard gas that attack all different parts of your respiratory system, your eyes, your mouth. It, it's, they all do sort of very nasty things. But you, the other part to this is that we had, you know, by 1914, there hadn't really been a major world war like this in a hundred or so years. There had been small wars, the Boer War, uh, Franco-Prussian War. All those are sort of smaller engagements, and, and most of them last only for a couple of, you know, a couple of years at most. Most for just a couple of months. However, by 1914... We're having a really long protracted war, 1914, 15, 16, 17, 18. You have old war ta tactics meeting new war technology. And as a result of that, as a result of that, you have an increase in death. World War I is the most deadly war up until this point ever, and it will be surpassed by World War II. And part of that is due to the new technologies. The technologies themselves were extremely harsh, right? So we know that the machine gun was used in the imperialist movement of the 19th century. And when it comes into war, 
we now have a phase where the fighting that goes on is extremely devastating. You have, you know, if you remember, if you've ever seen a movie of the Civil War, the American Revolution, they depict fighting where soldiers basically just line up and start marching towards each other. Well, when you give a machine gun to the opposing side, if you're just marching at them, you can just start mowing them down uh, and basically you know, just shoot you know, into the bodies. So these old style tactics are now meeting these new style war uh, warfare technology and it's de destroying populations. So in order to stop that, one of the things that they do there's, is they start to dig trenches. Um, now trench warfare had always been used in um, wars, but what they do here is they start using this uh, trench warfare to really prolong the battles. And the extent to which they sort of crisscross Europe is unbelievable. So there's thousands, you know, hundreds of miles of, of trenches. Um, now they're usually about five, four to five feet deep where you're basically hunkering down in them and people are trying to shoot over you. They're extremely dangerous. And we'll talk about the dangers in just a second. All of this is, is sort of helping to show that, you know, that we're, this is not going to be a quick battle, right? Also, if you're in one trench, in order to capture the next trench, you have to run over and try and capture that. It's extremely devastating. A lot of people are, are getting killed. Um, the other thing they develop is artillery. Uh, basically just try and sh kill people from far away. So artillery is long range firepower that basically uh, you can shoot about a quarter to a half a mile. It's extremely devastating, right? Because it just blows up and, and kills hundreds of people. It's a really devastating thing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the trenches. So trench warfare was... Uh, so this would be a picture of the trench, right? So you basically did two trenches parallel to each other. Allies on one, uh, um, Entente powers Western, Britain, France, Russia on one side, and then on the other side, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and they basically f look at each other and fight. In some places, they may be very far apart, you know, up to a mile apart. In other places, they may be really close, up to about 300 yards apart. Uh, so, what, three football fields, right? Uh, a quarter of a mile or so. They're really, really close together. In between those two trenches, what they do is they put thing put obstacles so that people so that soldiers the opposing soldiers can't come through and try and attack them. So what they do is they put up as you you could see here, right? They put up barbed wire, sandbags. They might put a mine or something here to try and stop or delay others from coming. We call this no man's land because this would be where no man should be. This is a place where People would die in huge numbers. It was extremely tough. Now, you in this trench, right, um, you have the ground, obviously. You have a place where somebody could stand to sort of shoot across, sandbags to stop uh, bullets. You have a little parapet where people could sort of sit and then shoot their machine guns. Pretty, pretty good stuff, right? Water would collect down here, so people were constantly getting their feet wet, and they'd be wet for days and days and days. This would cause an illness caused uh, called trench foot, and you can Google image this. It's kind of kind of nasty. Trench foot would be uh, basically where your foot was was so wet and so damp constantly, it would start to rot, um, and you you would die of people could die of of gangrene or or in, of blood infections because of this. Uh, you also have a lot of disease coming through the trenches because of mice being there, guys being in close quarters, no real showering or bathing. This is a really, really dangerous place for people to be. Uh, so people are not only just dying from the wars and then the new technologies and they're going over into no man's land, but they're dying from disease and trench foot. So these are really tough things. And we'll talk more about sort of the impact of technology uh, in the next video.